Welcome back, chemistry superstars. We're going to pick up on um, page two of the chapter five notes, looking at properties of the nonmetals. Um, so first I want to kind of look at, we saw that group one has one valence, group two has two valence, and then columns three through 12 have uh, about two valence. We'll talk about it more. I forgot to mention how many valence electrons the inner transition have. Well, it's, uh, we'll say two for right now. We'll say two valence electrons. We'll look at that more in depth later. Let's look at the nonmetals now. So we're going to look at, we're going to go um, working from right to left. We're going to start with the noble gases. So noble gases are in column 18. We used to call that column 8A. You might see why in a second. Those have exactly eight valence electrons. And those are our noble gases. So let's go to our periodic table and let's show where those are. So right here, noble gas. They all have eight valence electrons, except for helium, the lone guy that only has two valence electrons. Um, then we're going to go to our next column. This is column 17. Used to be called 7A. Back in the day, we called it 7A. And you know why? Because it has seven valence electrons. These are called the halogens. Um, you also might occasionally hear them referred to as the halides. If you're talking to a really, really old school chemist, sometimes they're even called the salt formers. And these are all pretty reactive. Um, and let's label those on the periodic table. So right here, I'm just gonna simplify and only call these the halogens. These are the halogens. And I do have some of the old numbers. So if you look at how the numbers go in the columns, we, you know, we did one to 18 in class, but here are the old numbers, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. We really much skip that whole D block. And it actually corresponds to the number of valence electrons they have. So everything in column one has one valence. Everything in column two has two valence. Everything in column 13, 3A has three valence, four valence, five valence, six, seven, and eight valence. Then our D and F blocks have, you know, about two valence electrons. More to follow on that later. Um, next group. So we had um, 1817. We have column 16. And you guessed it, that used to be called old column 6A. And it's because they have six valence electrons. So we had, you know, fancy names for everything we've talked about so far. Column 16, not as fancy, but we call it the oxygen family. If you want to get really technical, and if you're really good at speaking Greek, sometimes you will see these re referred to as the Chalcogen family. The Chalcogen family. And that just means basically water formers. Um, because they have oxygen in it. So let's label that one. The oxygen family is column 16 on the periodic table. So here, well, we're just going to call it the oxygen family. Eh, why not? You know what? Let's go with the chalk again. Why not? We'll be technically correct here. These are the chalk again. And then let's go to column 15. That was old column 5A because they all have exactly five valence electrons. Now we got really creative with the oxygen family. Guess what this family is called right here? It's called the nitrogen family. It's called the nitrogen family. And if you want to get really, really fancy again and surprise all of your classmates with your ability to speak ancient Greek, this is also very rarely referred to as the Nictogen family, P-N-I-C-T-O-G-E-N. Hardly anyone ever calls it that, but you, you could if you wanted to. So that's this column right here. Okay, what do you think the next family might be called? If you guessed carbon, you're right. So we have column 14 or old column 4A, and it has four valence electrons. And that one is called the carbon family. And I was not able to find any ancient Greek name for this, so we're just gonna stick with the carbon family. Um, now, if you're thinking I missed something, what about column four, or 13? So we said 14 is the carbon family. 
what about what's going on with this column right here? Well, we need to look at where the metalloids are. So I'm going to try and draw this in very carefully. So looking at the stair step line that you drew in class with your coloring, the periodic table. And we've defined the um, oh, rats. Let's try that again. So we've defined that the, um, the metalloids touch that stair step line. There's six that everyone can agree on are definitely metalloids. And then there's two or three more that people kind of like, eh, they say they could be, they couldn't be. So ones that are definitely metalloids. Silicon's definitely a metalloid, as is germanium. Um, antimony, tellurium, arsenic. And then here's where people kind of start getting a little bit wishy-washy. Boron's definitely a not or a metalloid too, but then what about these other ones that touch the stair step line? Aluminum, you have aluminum foil, it's shiny, it's metallic, um, you can bend it. It's it's pretty much metal. Not many people will ever call that a metalloid. Carbon, mm, pretty non-metally. A few people will argue that it could be slightly metalloidish, but usually not. Um, here's where the kind of questions come in. What about polonium? Yeah, it has properties of both. Acetine kind of have properties of both. And then we get down here to these elements. Oh, it's kind of like maybe, maybe not. Um, so these ones are more questionable. So here we have our metalloids. I'm going to make a note right here. And this here, we have column 13 or 3A. They all have three valence electrons. We can call that the boron family or maybe the aluminum family. Um, so let's go back to our notes. Make sure I add those in. So aluminum is more of a metal. So we'll say column number 13 or 3A. It's actually got a mixture of non-metals, metalloids in it. Um, so it's a little, a little tricky. We can call that the aluminum group. And it all has three valence electrons. But we've got to look more in depth about what's actually going on in that group. Because boron falls more, well, more on the non-metal side. Um, gallium, metalloid. And then indium and thallium are definitely more of the metals. And so we'll talk about that here. Metalloids, they touch the stair step line. So they touch the zigzag or the stair step lines. The ones that we can easily agree on, boron, silicon, germanium, Sorry, sorry, writing out the whole word there. Germanium, astatine, antimony, and then tellurium. I'll say in parentheses, um, maybe polonium, maybe astatine. Oh, I misspoke. That's arsenic, not astatine. So maybe, and then a couple people might argue with you about aluminum and carbon, but, but probably not. And last thing I want to show on our periodic table, we see the S block, the D block, the F block, and I, I highlighted our metalloids. What block have I not highlighted yet? I have not highlighted the P block. So I'm going to go back through. So I'm going to use purple again. I wish I had another highlighter color, but I don't. So right here in all this purple, we have the P block when it comes to electron configurations. So we got the P block right here. When you go back and look at what we call all of these, remember the S and the P block together, we call the representative or the main group elements. Those were the ones that Mendeleev really knew about and he was working with when he developed his periodic table. So let's look at the classification of these groups. Alkali metals, group one, very active in water. They will go boom. We will see them explode in lab. Alkali earth metals, they react in water, not quite as energetically. The halogens, also called the halides or the salt formers, they are the most reactive nonmetals. Things like chlorine gas, bromine, iodine, pretty toxic stuff. And then we have the noble gases, unreactive nonmetals. These are the nice, easy to classify groups that have strong cohesive properties. Okay, now we're going to go to section 5.3, looking at electron configuration and periodic properties. It's all about attraction. So for the periodic law, periodicity. The physical and chemical properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. Like we already said this like activity we may or may not have done in class with the element cards. It is all about attraction. So I'm going to go through and try and give you an analogy for this. So I want you to pretend that you're at maybe like a concert and you, your favorite celebrity, your favorite singer is on stage performing and you want to get really, really close to them. So let's look at my stars I have over here. 
So here I have a bunch of stars. The star shows how attractive you are and how close you are. So if you could pick an area here, 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 where would you want to be to get the best concert experience? You all would say right here, right? We got the largest stars and the most of them. So it'd be like you're up really close front row and there's a whole bunch of your stars, your favorite singer, dancer is up there. So here's how that relates to the periodic table. It's all about attraction between the protons and the electrons. As we go from left to right, I add more protons. That means there's a stronger positive charge in the nucleus pulling in those, those negative electrons. So as I go from left to right, there is more attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud. As I go from um, top to bottom, I'm adding a lot more protons. Look here, like fluorine 9, fluorine 17, 35, 53, up to 117 for our last element there. That I'm really, really increasing the pull. I'm increasing the attraction. But what else is going on at the same time? So as I'm adding all those protons, there's a lot stronger attraction, but I'm also adding lots of energy levels. So we have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm at the seventh energy level. That means the electrons are getting further and further and further and further away. So if you have two magnets and you get them further and further away from each other, doesn't the attraction get a lot less? So where is the highest attraction in the periodic table? It's going to be up here because the electron cloud is so, so, so close to that positive nucleus. So as we go from left to right, attraction goes up because there's more protons. But as I go from top down, even though I'm increasing protons, the outer electrons are getting so much further away. It's like you're stuck in the nosebleed seats down here. You can barely even see the person on stage. The electrons here can barely even see or be attracted to that positive nucleus. So let's do a little bit of rearranging here with my stars. So we want to look at where is the best place to be on the periodic table if in terms of attraction. We want to be over towards the right and we want to be up towards the top. This is where electrons are most attracted to the nucleus. The top, because we're on the first, second energy level, that means electrons are physically close. And then right instead of left, because there are more protons dragging them in closer. Okay, so let's try and sum that up. So as you go across a period, attraction goes up. So it increases. And it increases because it's in the same energy level or the same electron shell. So same energy level or same shell. You could use either term if you wanted to. But now there's more protons. So there's a stronger pull between the nucleus and all of those electrons. And let's talk about as you go down a group, the attraction decreases. And it decreases because even though protons are going up, even though I'm adding a lot more protons, sorry, protons, I'm adding energy levels. So you are adding electron energy levels. So the electron cloud is bigger and further from that nucleus. So let's sum that trend up by looking at our periodic table. Highest attraction right here, lowest attraction down here. So the most attractive element actually is going to be fluorine. We'll talk about, you know, why it's not healing, but fluorine's the most attractive, and my least attractive down here is francium. Left to right, more attraction because there's more protons, and we're in that same energy level, the same row. More attraction going from bottom to top because the electron cloud is closer to the nucleus. Okay, this is like being in like the second row versus being up here in the nosebleed seats being so, so, so far away from the nucleus. So that is about where we're going to stop for this video. Next video, we're going to pick up and practice all of those trends.